So it's a real pleasure for me to be here at a session whose title is Ushering in a New Generation. Uh, when I heard that, uh, Ushering in a New Generation, it really resonated with me because I thought, wow, that's basically my job description. I'm a professor, a professor of engineering. And so my job is basically to hang out with members of the next generation, you know, the students, and to help them learn the skills that they're gonna need to be successful and go on to help make the world a better place. And so we're here today not to talk about the next generation in the most general sense, but specifically with regard to coffee. And as we're gonna hear about in this session, a big part of that is the next generation of coffee consumers. But I would argue that equally important if not more important, is the next generation of thought leaders and innovators for the coffee industry, because they're the ones who are gonna be leading the coffee industry through an increasingly technological, increasingly complicated, increasingly globalized world. And so what I'd like to do today is to ask a question, I think a provocative question, that really cuts to the heart of the specialty coffee industry and its future. And the question is this, Will it ever be possible to get a PhD in coffee science? Will it ever be possible to get a PhD in coffee science? And so let me, let me uh, clarify what I mean. And so there's of course already many talented individuals in the coffee industry who have advanced degrees in various subjects. So for example, you might have a, somebody with a PhD in chemistry who studied uh, uh, phenolics in coffee. Or you might have somebody who has a PhD in plant genetics who helped sequence the coffee genome. So that's not what I mean. What, I, what I'm talking about here is an honest to goodness actual PhD in coffee science from a real university where it actually says coffee science on the diploma. And where that diploma represents completion of a focused sequence of courses dedicated to coffee and most importantly, having contributed original research that's helped shed light and helped improve the status of coffee science. Will it ever be possible to get such a PhD in coffee science? So some of you might be thinking, well, wait a second, man, you know, coffee is a beverage, it's not an academic discipline. And I would say to those people that an academic discipline is any topic that receives focused academic attention. And so a key thing to realize is that there are already several products, many products, that are already the focus of uh, academic attention. And so one example is crude oil, crude oil. So it's a black, you know, oozy, smelly liquid and it's been possible for decades to get a PhD in petroleum engineering from some of the top universities of the world, including places like Stanford. So another example that's closer to coffee would be wine. Okay? And so it's been possible for a long time also to get an advanced degree in viticulture and enology. Uh, that's the technical terms for growing grapes and making wine. Um, and I think my guess is that everybody in this room has, or is, has heard of Napa Valley. Okay? And you can make a credible argument that the wild success of Napa Valley over the past half century as a wine producing region is really associated with the academic research and the students trained by the Department of Viticulture and Enology at my school, UC Davis, which is right down the road from Napa Valley. If you don't like crude oil and if you don't like wine, then maybe you like beer. Okay, I love beer. Um, but with regard to academics, it's the same story. There are several uh, academic programs across the country that teach uh, beer, okay, including at UC Davis, and there's an astonishing number of people who have advanced degrees in beer brewing um, in the beer industry and at craft breweries across the country. So that's um, what I'm trying to say here is that there's basically, there's no intrinsic or inherent reason why coffee can't be an academic discipline, okay? And for a variety of historical reasons in this country, it has not been. Most of these historical reasons are associated with the way that federal funding for research flows. The short story is that coffee is not grown in the US, so there wasn't a large impetus to support coffee research here. Okay. So before going into more details about that, let me first answer a question that might be on some of your minds, which is why is this guy up here talking about the future of coffee education? Okay. And so I said at the beginning that I'm an engineer, okay. and specifically I'm a chemical engineer. And so why is a chemical engineer up here talking about the future of coffee education? And so <clears throat> let me answer that in two uh, regards. So the first uh, point is that there are already, chemical engineering is already tightly integrated into the food industry in general. And so I already mentioned, for example, the viticulture and enology department at UC Davis. The chair of that department is Professor David Block. He actually has his PhD in chemical engineering. He's a member, a joint member in my department. He got his PhD from the University of Minnesota. So the wine program at UC Davis, the famous wine program, is led by a chemical engineer. 
Another department at UC Davis is the Department of Food Science and Technology. Uh, that's also another world-class department. Its chair is uh, Mike McCarthy. He got his PhD in chemical engineering from Berkeley. So already academic programs focused on you know, food and uh, beverages are led by chemical engineers. That's not always the case that both those departments are led by chemical engineers, but it demonstrates the role that they play. So that's, that's in general, chemical engineering plays a role. More specifically, why me? Okay, well, so why am I up here? And so let me do something which might be kind of crazy, which is to try to summarize 17 years of my academic career in one slide. And so what are we looking at here? Again, I'm doing something crazy, trying to summarize 17 years of research. My area of expertise is something called complex transport phenomena. And so that's the way chemical engineers refer to how molecules move from one place to another, okay? And it turns out that oftentimes that process involves fluid mechanics, so my area of expertise involves fluid mechanics. And so what you're looking at here, there's a whole bunch of things. If you look at the top left corner, there's these little black dots moving around the screen. That represents my dissertation research. So it has to do with the title of my thesis was Electric Field Induced Assembly of Colloidal Particles, which is the fancy way of saying that I took little tiny plastic balls in water and zapped them with electricity. Okay. And they did funny things. In this case, they aggregated. Uh, since then, I've branched out into a bunch of things. This movie in the top center shows a water droplet in oil moving around uh, in an electric field that's thousands of volts, okay? and so it's bouncing back and forth. On the right, there's this blue water droplet uh, making a so-called vortex roll and leaving a daughter droplet behind, um, again, in oil. This movie down on the bottom represents uh, some research that I'm doing on blood cells, so red blood cells moving through a microfluidic channel. My lab has expertise in extracting quantitative information from high-speed video. And the, the, the bottom left one is not a movie, but it shows a still frame from an experiment where I'm using a laser sheet to eliminate smoke particulates in air. And we're studying the physics of this to try to understand or try to help some virologists understand airborne disease transmission. So all of these topics and many others that I've worked on have papers with lots of you know, meaty theoretical analyses and equations. Um, so I'm just trying to give a flavor for it. The overarching, even though these might seem disparate, the overarching theme here is that they all have to do with something called in the community that we refer to as complex fluids. And so about four years ago, I started thinking about a different complex fluid, uh, one that has thousands of components, one whose properties change wildly depending on how you prepare it. Okay. And of course, I'm talking about coffee, right? Four years ago, I was hanging out with my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Tanya Kuhl, and we were thinking about a problem for our upper division chemical engineering laboratory courses. We're, we're always trying to make them better. We're trying to you know, make new experiments that help train our students how to think quantitatively like engineers. And we were actually in the hallway having a conversation over coffee. And Tanya um, suggested, why don't we take apart a Mr. Coffee drip brewer and have the students analyze it? And when I heard that, when I thought a light went off in my head, and I thought, oh my gosh, forget a single experiment. Why don't we make a whole class? Why don't we make a whole class about coffee? And so one reason that really resonated with me is that for a long time I've been thinking about the challenge of how do we attract students into science and engineering. And I was, uh, at the time, very motivated by a story that I heard um, about my colleagues in the mycology department at UC Davis, mycology. Uh, if you were like me and have no idea what mycology is, it's the study of mushrooms. Okay? And their introductory course was called Introduction to Mycology. And they had very few students sign up for it because it's just a problem with branding. Nobody knew what it was. Nobody signed up for it. They changed the name of their class to Mushrooms, Molds, and Society. And their enrollment went up. And the number of students majoring in mycology increased. And for them, it was a big victory. Okay? And so I thought, this coffee idea, hey, this sounds great. I didn't know anything about coffee. But I had this vague sense that the entire chemical engineering curriculum could be mapped on to the process of making coffee. And if you think about it, what do you do when you make coffee? The very first thing you do is you take coffee beans and you roast them. There's a whole host, a whole sequence of complicated chemical reactions that take place when you convert it from green bean into a roasted bean. And then what do you do? Then you have a separation process. Chemical engineers love studying separation, right? where you extract the molecules that you want, the tasty flavor molecules, the caffeine, out of the solid phase and into the liquid phase. That's an example of complex mass transfer. Okay. There are other examples uh, from our curriculum. You can think about energy. You can think about the laws of thermodynamics. It takes energy. It takes heat transfer to make coffee. So it would seem like there's a way that uh, we can go forward with this. And so what we did was we created a new class. Okay? And so here's the course description. It's called ECM1, The Design of Coffee, Introduction to Chemical Engineering. It's a non-mathematical introduction to how chemical engineers think, as illustrated by elucidation of the process of roasting and brewing coffee. It's a qualitative overview of the basic principles of engineering analysis and design, corresponding experiments testing design choices on the sensory qualities of coffee. 
Okay. In a nutshell, here it is. At Davis, we're on the quarter system, so the quarters are 10 weeks long, so we have nine experiments. Here are the nine different labs uh, that we do. We have, it's an actual lab course. We have, each week we have one hour of lecture and two hours of lab, okay? In the first week, we do the taking apart of Mr. Coffee Drippur, uh, see how it works. The next one, next week, we focus on conservation of mass. We think about mass balances. We talk about process flow diagrams. We focus the next week on the pH of coffee. We actually have the students measure the pH of coffee versus time as it just sits there on a plate to teach them a little bit about chemical kinetics and uh, reactions. We talk about measuring the energy. We talk about mass transfer. We do all the experiments where we vary the grind size and see how that affects matters. We talk about fluid flow and uh, extraction. And then we switch into the design trials, which I'll get back to in a second. Just to give you an example of how we think about this, okay, here's some actual slides that are from the lecture. So you guys are getting a free lecture uh, today. And the very first picture we put up is, is this. We put up some green beans and we say, here's, here's what chemical engineers do. They take matter in one form and they convert it to a, a more desirable form. And how do we do that? And so here, everybody in this audience is very familiar with this. The students, a lot of them don't have any idea about this. They don't even know that coffee beans start out as green. But we start with this picture and say, well, here's what the steps, what you do is you roast it, then you bag it, then you grind it, then you brew it, then you have your cup of coffee. And this is one way of that, thinking about it. But the way a chemical engineer thinks about it is like this. And so here's a process flow diagram, okay? And so there's two messages here. One is that like, chemical engineers can take anything and make it more, much more complicated looking. But more importantly, what we train them to do is to think about a process holistically. You can't just think about the things that you're pushing buttons on. You have to think about how all the different material streams flow through the process, including the waste streams, and think about how much mass flows through each one, how much energy uh, flows through each one. And so here's a, a quick example of one um, result. So we focus, for example, on what happens to the water in coffee. We use the principle of conservation of mass, and we derive useful equations. I'm, I'm an engineer, so they kick me out of the club if I don't have at least one equation in every talk. So here it is. Okay. And so here's actually a very useful equation. Okay. And so this basically answers the question, hey, it, you know, how much coffee am I going to get to drink as a function of how much water I feed in? and how much dry grounds I put in, okay? And we introduced this idea of the absorption ratio. And what's beautiful to an engineer, they look at this equation and they say, oh man, this is a linear equation. There's a prediction here. And here's an example. This is actually a graph produced by a student uh, a couple years ago. Here's the mass of the brew versus the mass of the coffee grounds. And voila, it's actually a straight line. So engineers love that. When you have a theoretical prediction, that's corroborated by experimental uh, data. So that, that's one example. We have a whole sequence of examples like this. This is conservation of mass. We also talk about conservation of energy. We talk about fluid flow. And the whole thing culminates uh, towards the end of the class in an engineering design competition. And so what we do is we have a competition where they have to make the best tasting coffee that they can, as judged by a blind taste panel, using the least amount of energy. And so we actually use these things. We measure how many kilowatt hours they use. The students have a blast. We actually have a gong. We ring the gong. We give them 45 minutes. And it's, you know, it's a lot of fun. And the students have a blast. And so I already mentioned the beer program at UC Davis. And so it's taught by this guy named Charlie Banforth, Professor Charlie Banforth. He's uh, arguably the best beer professor in the world. His class for years has been one of the most popular classes at UC Davis. I mean, it's college, it's beer. You know, what's, it goes together, right? And so he was even uh, listed by Playboy magazine as one of the top 20 professors in the world, not because of how he looks, but because he's talking about beer. And so you can see the, this is how many students you're looking at a pot of how many students per academic year. And if you read the bio, you can see where, the, where this is going. The punchline here is that now coffee beats beer. Okay. And so we started, we, we started in uh, 2013 with a freshman seminar with just 18 students. We worked out all the bugs. We didn't know what we were doing. Okay. We had a lot of help from the coffee industry. And this has grown. This year, we now have uh, 15, oh, more than 1,500 students go through the class. So it's been wildly successful. It's now the most popular general education elective at UC Davis. Okay, that's a freshman level introductory course. And like what I'd like to do in the last few minutes here is get back to my original question, which is, will it ever be possible to have not just a freshman level course, but a whole PhD program in coffee science? Let's think about that for a second. So here is my rendition of a curriculum, just a little cartoon of a uh, pyramid that kind of represents the structure of an academic curriculum. And so at the bottom, you have your introductory lower division courses. Many people can take those. And then you have your more specialized upper division courses then your uh, more advanced graduate level courses. And at the very top of the pyramid at a, you know, a, a research university okay, is research. Okay? So the PhD students are doing research. And so the message I'm trying to convey here is that at UC Davis, at least, we already have the base of the pyramid. We have a, a very successful, uh, widely attended course introducing engineering and science principles in terms of coffee. All right? So we have the base of the pyramid. But as we go forward, how can we make 
a graduate level curriculum. And so here's just my thoughts, okay, on, on the type of core curriculum that a either very specialized upper division or graduate level uh, curriculum would look like. And it would consist of several courses. The very first one, it would be, for example, physical principles of coffee, okay? This is a course I would love to teach, okay? So we only go through very rudimentary stuff in the di design of coffee. At a graduate level, we can go into much more detail on like, the kinetics of Maillard reactions, on uh, the details of convective and conductive uh, heat transfer, talk about psychrometrics, talk about filtration, talk about Darcy's law, and fluid flow, whole host of things, all the physics that affect the final quality of the cup. Okay, that'd be a great graduate level course. But the great thing about being at a university is that there are many other experts, okay, that, that I don't have the expertise in, but that you could uh, help make a graduate level curriculum. And so in the wine program, for example, they have something called chemical analysis of wine. It talks about uh, spectroscopic techniques, uh, GCMS, things like that, right? Why not a chemical analysis of coffee, right? Here's just another example, physical chemistry of milk. I mean, you know that most cafes, the majority of the volume in the cafe is not coffee, but actually milk in various forms. We've heard a lot about cold brew today. A lot of those have dairy products in it, so that's an important topic. You can't really talk about coffee unless you have some expertise in like, where it's actually coming from. So some, a course in the coffee physiology and horticulture. Right? There's actually a professor at Davis who's developing a course right now focusing on that in coffee. And then as a final one, you could think, oh, let's tie it all together with a course dedicated to sensory evaluation. Okay? Not just tasting panels, but also learning about the statistics that really uh, drive quantitative uh, analysis of sensory uh, impressions. And then at the very top of this, and this is what I want to emphasize for this audience, that you can't really have this pyramid. This pyramid is incomplete unless you have research at the top. Right? So I think we've already heard a couple times today that coffee needs more research. Okay? Well, where, where does research? Universities. Okay? So let me just go back and answer my original question. Will we ever have a PhD in coffee science? Well, the answer is yes, okay, if the community wants it. All right? So we've already made some progress at UC Davis. And if you guys want to partner uh, with us, if we want to go forward and try to create a PhD or advanced uh, degree in coffee science, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And I think that'll be the best way of helping usher in the next generation. Thank you. Thank you.